With the introduction of Ryzen and Coffee Lake, a new war, the third war of CPU design schools has emerged. But before we dive into the new CPU war, I think it's important to have a quick history lesson on the evolution of CPU design, what pushed the evolution of those designs, and why it has, including a look at the first two great wars. Let's start all the way back in 1995 with Intel P6 architecture, which today's Intel CPUs are a long derivative of. The P6 architecture is a high-performance CPU architecture used in the Pentium Pro and the Pentium 3. Although we will mainly be looking at the Pentium 3, mainly due to the fact that it was the CPU in frontline service during the early days of the first great war, the Megahertz War. This started about the turn of the century, back when AMD had lower clocked, higher IPC CPUs. Many people don't know there's a faster PC processor than Pentium 3 at any clock speed. The new AMD Athlon processor! That ad was part of a campaign from AMD that ran from 1999 into 2000. That was targeted as showing that clock speeds were not everything. Back in those days, people's perception of performance was pretty much based upon clock speeds as the idea of IPC hadn't penetrated the enthusiast community yet. This begun a war of clock speeds as Intel fought AMD head to head for the highest clock speeds during a day when AMD had higher IPC. A rapid increase in clock speeds ensued as in the space of 21 months, clock speeds had increased by about two and a half times from 600 megahertz to 1.4 gigahertz just on this architecture. Those were the early days of the megahertz war, back before Intel had a specially designed architecture. So came the next wave of Intel CPUs, the Pentium 4. This was a brand new and radically different architecture. The architecture was built for speed and speed alone. Intel had made the first attempt at a CPU that went for clock speed over IPC, and in hindsight, AMD should have taken note. And it was a catastrophe, or little short of. See, to understand we must then look at how they achieved those speeds, and what they had to give up. But first, going back to the Pentium 3, you'll know how I said it is a modern CPU, and it is. It features pretty much all of the modern technologies and design ideas in a modern CPU that makes it great. Honestly, the P6 architecture was ahead of the curve, and you'll see later on. So let's look at what made it special. The Pentium 3 had modern technologies such as updatable microcode. It also had register renaming, which allowed registers to be assigned to multiple values from different programs as each register is virtualized. This allowed multiple programs to run concurrently on a car without one having to wait for its registers to become freed. This in turn allowed for out-of-order execution, where code is run before it is actually meant to execute if the code that should be running now is still not ready for execution, such as if we have two statements, x and y, that are in the order of x and then y. Both statements can be executed and any change in a potential shared register that is executed out of program order will be stored. Once both statements are executed, they are put in a reorder buffer to be sorted back into the program order, ready for retirement. This means both X and Y will resolve correctly, even if Y was executed first. The next modern feature is a higher resolution pipeline, or a longer pipeline of 10 or 11 stages. Some sources say 10, some say 11. The one I'm going off says 11. This longer pipeline allowed for higher operating frequencies by making each stage smaller, although it will increase latency both relative and absolute at lower clock speeds. Although I think CPU pipelines is something for another video, along with out of order execution and register renaming. The Pentium 3 was not developed with any major design focuses in mind. Essentially, it wasn't trying to win a war, as none had yet started, but the Pentium 4 came out with a net burst architecture, and this had a war to win, which meant higher frequencies were the name of the game, and at the time enthusiasts were less aware of things like IPC, Anyway, this all came at a cost of low IPC and high instruction latency. The Pentium 4 was very long, but very narrow. Not only that, but the technology to feed it just was not really there at the time. Now don't get me wrong, the netburst architecture brought about really the only other modern technologies that make a modern CPU today, such as good branch prediction. I don't remember off the top of my head if the P6 architecture had branch prediction, but either way, if it did, it wasn't all that advanced, and the major gains were made here, with the NetBurst architecture. Another thing that NetBurst pioneered was a little thing called hyperthreading, which you may have heard of. That's Intel's brand name for SMT. AMD has finally made their own implementation of it for Ryzen. I can't remember what they call it, but they're over 15 years behind there. There were other technologies introduced, like modern decoded instruction caches, which actually allow the pipeline length to change, depending on if the instruction has been called recently or not. Again, AMD was 15 years behind until Ryzen. 
Unfortunately, Netburst was still a massive failure, even with massive clock speed increases of about two times, the reasons for which we're about to get into. Firstly, the new pipeline was very long, comedically long, which is something it's rarely only known for. In the later revisions, the pipeline reached a maximum of about 30 stages and started at 20. In comparison to today's processors, it doesn't look too absurd, but in those days there was just no way to correctly feed this processor without major issues. The long pipeline caused massive stalls if a branch misprediction occurred, then all data leading back up to the L1 and maybe even the entire L2 cache was wrong, considering how small caches were back in those days. And considering there was also no L3 cache, the only way from here was to go to main memory, which only added another dimension of pain. I used to have a netburst based Celeron, I believe. I don't remember all that much about the Pentium 3 and the Celeron that I had, all I remember was the RAM, it was the RAM bust RAM, which had high latency. Not only this, but also I remember back in those days, the memory controller was attached to the CPU via the north bridge, which meant going through two interfaces and a chipset, further increasing latency. Essentially, whenever that CPU needed to go to main memory, it stopped for a long time, and that happened a lot. Apparently, Intel expected the high CPU frequency to be able to compensate, it's like walking somewhere and taking 10 big steps or 30 little steps and expecting to walk the same distance. The big steps won. Also, every time you take a step in the wrong direction, you have to find out where you are again for ages. And this isn't offset by the fact that your smaller steps can happen quicker. Now, if it didn't seem bad enough, it gets worse. Quite a bit worse, in fact. Not only is the architecture very long, but very narrow. How narrow? Well, it's four parts wide, whereas the P6 was six parts wide. By the way, the parts are kind of like lanes or buses that they get the data to the execution units, and there are typically multiple execution units per part. But to put it in another light, Netburst had seven execution units, whereas the P6 had 13. Intel thought, again, that they could get around this by pulling a sneaky trick and double pumping the ALUs, that is, make them run at two times the CPU frequency. Now this doesn't really work, especially on ALUs that are as simple as the ones in this architecture. The first ALU is somewhat complex, where it can do branch predictions and data stores, so it may actually take quite a number of clock cycles to complete these tasks, so double pumping it may help. Also this ALU shares a part with an FPU, which also takes multiple clock cycles. Now I don't want to get too much into balancing the parts bandwidth here, but this kind of makes sense, particularly in float workloads less so in integer workloads. Sure, the integers will fly through, but the overall CPU throughput is reduced. The second ALU is where things get even worse. It's a very simple ALU that can only do int, add and subtraction. This takes literally one or maybe two clock cycles, therefore double pumping this ALU won't really help performance. In fact, it can have a negative effect. This ALU shares its part with three execution units, which and if the port can only feed one unit at a time, this single ALU could potentially fully saturate its port, starving the other two execution units, which is an integer bit shifter and another float unit. Maybe I'll cover more of this in another video. Now it gets even worse still. AMD really should have seen the bulldozer catastrophe coming. Now these CPUs run fast. They were designed for it, and in fact one of my housemates still has his old Pentium 4 CPU up and running. He got it to run at 4 GHz, bearing in mind that that's based upon 90 nanometers, and these ALUs were double pumped. A few smaller points were that in order to simplify the ALUs, they dropped support for rotating bits through a register with a barrel shifter, and this was a relatively common instruction at the time. Things like this new instruction support meant that either code had to be recompiled with these new rules in mind, or just ran poorly. And guess which one happened? Anyway, realising their mistake, Intel did what AMD should have done by the time Haswell hit the market for Bulldozer. It would probably have saved AMD a lot. Intel went back to their previous architecture, which by this point was now celebrating its 11th birthday, the good old P6 architecture from 1995. Honestly, AMD should have gotten back to the old Athlon 2s and tried to bring them back to the modern day as a stopgap. Anyway, back to Intel. So they didn't have much time, and so that meant dropping the majority of the technology from Netburst, and pretty much just modernising the P6 to become the Core 2 architecture. It now had 7 parts, so its width has increased, and also it had a larger number of complex ILUs. The thing could really fill up the units without much idle time per unit. Also with this came a better manufacturing process and a shorter pipeline, though still longer than the Pentium 3, 
but due to much larger frequencies, instruction latency was greatly improved. Many car CPUs were also introduced, which allowed work to continue should one car stall. Branch prediction was improved, and also by this time we were seeing DDR and DDR3, and much better front side bus speeds, which allowed faster RAM access times. This did come at a cost. Frequencies dropped dramatically. Instead of having a CPU run at 3.8GHz, you now expected your CPU to run at 2.5GHz, even if the 2.5GHz CPU was faster. This officially marked the end of the GHz war and the beginning of the IPC war, which would continue in for much longer.